a few written documents remain from Egypt. And that's kind of interesting. It's not that there probably weren't, there might have been. And in fact, we're going to discover that they used this kind of purple dye to write. We already know they use um, um, papyrus. And what lasts longer, stone or papyrus? Stone. So um, maybe the funerary, the funeral boxes, which were in cement, and maybe the artifacts, which often were in uh, kind of stone, survived, whereas the written documents didn't. But, you know, we always say, oh, we think of Egypt as, you know, pyramids, and they were so into... Uh, death, there was a cult of death. Um, in fact, we don't really know. This is a perfect psychological thing. This is what we do with history. We project onto it. When we don't really know, maybe they had just as much um, joie de vivre and joy of life than anybody else. It's just that that's all that survived. That's all that historians, historians and archaeologists can find. So we obsess about mummies and things like that. Um, because what we do know is they had a god named Osiris. And Osiris and Isis, his sister, Isis, similar to a name we've heard today, uh, not an accident, Isis and Osiris were the two sibling uh, gods of ancient Egypt. And Osiris supposedly is the god of the afterlife and the future. And... Um, when he dies, he's broken up into all these different pieces and scattered around all over Egypt. Um, and his sister, Isis, collects him, puts him all together. Um, and in a way, it is a, um, it is a very joyful, positive, future-looking symbol for their gods um, and their future. So the and I bet that has something to do also with the idea that the Nile River would overflow like a delta once every year, like clockwork. Uh, it would overflow, giving the um, people of Egypt, Upper and Lower Egypt, quite a bit of wealth, agricultural goods, etc. Um, now, before I do want to interject something about. Um, Egypt, Imhotep, and the step pyramids you can read about. Um, the pyramids at Giza, if you look at your map, you'll see that Giza, you'll see where Giza is, that that's in Lower Egypt. And um, and I just want to say that uh, Egypt is divided into what we call time periods that are called kingdoms. There's the Old Kingdom, and in between that old kingdom is what we call an intermediate period. Then there's the middle kingdom, intermediate period. Then there is the new kingdom. Okay, so just counterintuitive, like we learned about uh, lower and upper Egypt. The history of Egypt, if you're an Egyptian scholar and interested in this, is divided into the old kingdom, the intermediate period, the Middle Kingdom, maybe that's where some of these science fiction deals come from, I don't know, and then an intermediate period. Some historians believe that as the Old Kingdom changes power and gives way to the intermediate period, that period is when the most uh, revolution or the most change occurs. I don't know, but um, I do know that the uh, Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, and Newer Kingdom was when there was fairly steady um, rule. The Old Kingdom is from approximately 2686 to 2160. That period we don't have a lot of written documents about. Uh, the Middle Kingdom is from approximately... Um, um, the Middle Kingdom, I would say, is about... Um, you know, um, let's say 1800 BCE um, on. And then we have, of course, the New Kingdom, which we're going to see many more written um, areas of um, Egyptian culture 
develop. Let me talk for a minute just about Egyptian culture and society. I'm not going to get into too much of the pyramids, the old kingdom. By the way, if you go to the Met, one of the other things you'll see is a female pharaoh. Of course, her presentation was often male, but perhaps she was the next in line. We don't know. Um, okay, let's just talk about Egyptian society for a second. Um, what do we know about Egypt in general? We know they believed in a central god and that the Nile was part of it. Rejuvenation in life, Osiris and his coming back together. We know they were dependent upon agriculture. Um, we know they saw themselves as superior to all other um, civilizations around them. And, of course, and in fact, they were very stable and secure because they learned to predict and to um, save their wealth as the um, Nile would overflow like clockwork every year. A uh, person, as I said, was either an Egyptian or a foreigner. They had a religious worldview that was common. Um, they were united, and in fact, except for a very brief period, they remain united throughout history and even are today. Um, so it's one of the longest uh, remaining civilizations in the world and united civilization in the world. Um, at their center is this myth, if you will, of Osiris and Isis, the brother and sister, what's confusing, their brother and sister, husband and wife, but they remain the keys to revitalization and life. Uh, there was also the god that helped Isis um, with her brother's rejuvenation, and Nubis, he's really the god of the afterlife. Um, and as I said, we know a lot about the funerary texts because they're stone, etc. And as I said, maybe that's just because we know that they, the stone survives longer than paper. Uh, we know that Egyptians were great architects, obviously, from the pyramids. Uh, they had monumental architecture. We know they also had tremendous science, mathematics, followed the calendar. They calculated time. Um, they used the sun um, and the calendar for religious festivals. And in fact, the Egyptian calendar is the one that's going to be adopted later by the religious, the Julian calendar. Um, if you look at page 32 in your book, you can see, in fact, a funerary uh, document, and many believe that those documents that told the story of that elite or that individual um, would be buried with that, with that individual as would, let's say you were a brick worker or worked with gold, and as would a little bit of gold um, that you worked with. By the way, that's why there were so many crypt robbers um, early in the 1900s and people stole so many uh, Egyptian crypts because they had gold in them. They had valuables, gems, gold. People were buried with those riches. Okay, finally, I guess I pointed out that social pyramid, so this um, division of wealth that is going to develop early on, which is, you know, the elite, the pharaoh's family, the scribes, the priests, and of course, what about women? Well, they didn't really have formal law codes like uh, Hammurabi did in Sumeria. Um, but um, interestingly enough, women in Egypt were recognized as commoners and um, as persons in their own right. They were allowed to initiate divorce, and to be witnesses, to possess property. That's quite unlike women in some other areas of the world. Now, we don't really know why. Maybe that's because they were so isolated from other communities. We don't know why. Uh, women, however, were barred from holding high office. Um, but, of course, there were female priestesses, and there were, of course, at least one uh, female um, um, female um, pharaoh. Um, so let me just conclude this seg let's look at the difference between Sumeria and Nile. Sumeria, 
the rhythm of the community at the time was off kilter. It didn't always, even though they were dependent upon a water source, it didn't overflow in a regular clockwork, consistent manner, as did Egypt. The Nile River, of course, was huge, long, uh, provided tremendous wealth and riches and an opportunity to organize uh, into one great uh, dynastic um, kingdom, unlike... Um, really the kingdoms in Sumeria. Although you could make the argument that Gilgamesh leading to um, the Amorites and Hammurabi, you know, was their great civilization. But Egypt became much more, um, much wealthier. Egypt um, definitely developed a stratification in society, um, definitely understood time, had tremendous um, engineering, um, agricultural engineering, architecture, any of those things, and also developed a class of spiritual leaders, political leaders, uh, engaged in massive building. We don't really see that in Sumeria, like the... Um, uh, we see storage centers, we've gone through that, but we don't really see that. Um, as much as we see in Egypt. Okay, there. I want to conclude there about Egypt, and at the beginning and end of your chapter is a timeline and a review. A couple of odd things. What is the kind of writing of Egypt? That's called hieroglyphs. You've seen that. It's a kind of picture reporting, uh, using pictures. Um, it's like a little picture of a house for a house. Um, we will see. Um, but I do want to talk about, before we go on, the way in which history, or I guess I'll wait till next time, chapter two, the way in which history is used uh, by scientists and by historians, uh, and that artifacts are really used to change our vision of the past. And I will begin with that, with something that's discussed in chapter one, and that is something called the Rosetta Stone. You all can use that as an artifact as well. But I will begin chapter two discussing the Rosetta Stone because that totally altered uh, our way of viewing ancient history. Okie dokie, thank you.